Hey, kia ora everyone, it's Stephen Mo here. I just got a chance to sit down with Rahul from Philanthropy New Zealand over a really nice lunch. And um, he shared a bit of his own life story, his journey, and what Philanthropy New Zealand is doing. Um, we recorded it on video, and uh, so I just wanted to introduce that. That is what you're about to see now. If you're interested in this or joining lunches in the future, um, drop me a note. It's easy, stephenmo at perryfield.com. Um, and there's lots more resources that we put out for charities as well. So you might want to check those out. Um, these impact lunches happen about every month or so, and anyone is welcome to join them. Kakite ano. Uh, my name is Stephen Mo, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you all to this lunch. Um, this is called a, a Seeds Impact Lunch, um, and it's real good. We were just chatting about who was in the room, and I said, well, it's basically a real variety of people, but they're all unified by impact and purpose, that what they do probably um, has something to do with that, whether they're from a charity or supporting charities or business. So a real variety of people. So it's great to welcome you. Um, well, we might just shut that door, actually, because then the... Um, then we don't have all the music as well. <laughs> so just um, really briefly, these um, lunches, I've kind of forgotten how many we've done now over the years, but this would be probably number 30 or so. And some of you have been faithfully attending basically all of them, and some of you are new. So the point of this is that we want to connect people. And there's going to be people in this room that could support what you're doing, and equally you could support what they're doing. And quite often we just are like ships in the night and we pass not realizing, oh, what I need is what they could actually provide. So that's the one of the main focuses here um, is to connect and to do that. And I brought along a visual example of what I think each of you are doing, which is this red box. I don't know if anybody remembers. I brought this years ago to one of these. So this red box to me represents If you look at the front there, it says 1910, right? This was my, I'll get quite a little bit wrong, but my great, great aunt's box from Norway. It was handmade in Norway. That's Norwegian there on the front. And it was given to her. And it's lasted in our family now for, well, since 1910. It's a really long thing that's been special. And I think when we're crafting things in our work and in our lives, What are we creating and how are we doing it with creativity and doing it to make things that will last? Instead of just being, you know, you could have had a cardboard box and then just recycle it. But this has actually stayed as something that's been meaningful for our family for years and years. So in what you're doing, each of you are doing important things. Always remember that, like we have a lasting legacy and impact that we each can have. So hopefully that little picture can be something you take away with you. Um, and then I also wanted to mention um, we have an author in our presence. So Sean, I know you're not going to like this, but I'm going to call out that you're here. Um, I didn't bring a copy of the book, but here's a little bit of information that you can come and look at la later. It's called The Impact Professional. So Sean just released this. Was it a month ago? Yeah. Yeah, about a month ago. It's encouraging people to think about what you do in your work and how you can have impact. So you can have a chance to talk to him, um, local author doing some amazing mahi and work. Um, and then I wrote this book, so you're welcome to come and talk to me about it. It's called The Apple Tree. It's encouraging people that what you do matters, even if you don't see the results right away. So I'll put some copies around. You can have a look. I've got 3,500 copies in my garage that I'd like to like, get out so you can be my ambassadors. Um, and then the last thing is I'm doing Seeds podcast. So there's 393 conversations now with inspiring people. So when I follow up with this, I'll send a link and you can have a look. Subscribe, like, share, you know, all those things would be great. So thank you. So we're really lucky we've got Rahul here from, you live in Wellington normally, mm -hmm. but down here in, in Otatahi Christchurch. So I just thought we'll have a little korero talk Um, and that way you can introduce sort of what's going on in your world and then have a chance to connect with people. Um, once we finish, we can then move around. Like, don't just sit where you are. Try to meet as many people as you can. I guarantee you every person here has a story. So um, can you just tell us a little bit about when did you start this position, for example? Well, that's an easy question. And thank you, Stephen, for inviting me to, to talk to you all and... Thank you for giving up a little bit of your lunch hour to, to listen to me. 
Um, so I started in PNZ uh, right at the end of last year, November, um, October, November last year. So not not long. Yep. Um, and uh, been busy trying to learn as quickly as possible. So. The interesting thing to me is always people's life journeys. If mm -hmm. anybody's listened to Seeds, they'll hear about that. Tell us a little bit about before this, what you've been involved in. <laughs> um, actually, your story of um, uh, of the red box really resonated with me. So I, I was born in a small village in a small state with 55 million people uh, um, <laughs> of Kerala in South India. Uh, and for the first uh, four years of my life, uh, my dad worked for a multinational company, so we traveled around the world. So I lived in London, Sydney, a little bit in Singapore, went back to India, to Bombay. And um, uh, I'll do a short version of this. I'll do a longer version of this, which is more boring. Uh, so I could keep it, keep it short. Um, and we arrived back in, in Kerala when I was four. And uh, still now, but even back then, there were three types of schools that you could attend in Kerala. One was in the local language of Malayalam. The other one was lessons uh, delivered in Hindi. And the third type of medium was English medium school. So everything was delivered in English. And for people who are attending school, there were three types of futures that you're guaranteeing yourself or hedging for yourself. One was if you learned a local language, you pretty much got a job in the state. If you learned Hindi, you might get a government job uh, and travel out of the state. If you learn English, that's the opportunity to leave the country. So you want to get your child into the English school. Now, Kerala for many decades uh, was a Marxist um, uh, government. It was a, fed a federal government like Australia. And in the SO, it's a Marxist-led state, which means that it invested a lot in primary health care, primary education, self-reliance, renewable energy, and things like that. Uh, but it also meant that you couldn't really pay your way into the top schools. There was no facility to do that. But the top schools did have a, a means by which you could donate to attend the English medium school. And by this point, even though my dad, my family had come, um, came from a lower middle class um, background and lower middle class in India is extremely poor. Um, back then it meant no running water. Um, the first fridges for my family were in the 2013, 14 for some members of the of family, running water sort of the early uh, 2000s um, on the back of some of the money I've been sending back. But he was too proud and uh, back in the 80s when I was four, to pay a donation. He said, my, my boy is going to get in of his own back. And the way you do that is to write a scholarship exam at age four to get into primary school. Wow. Um, so, but I had, um, typically you spend a whole year learning with a private tutor at age four to write the scholarship exam at the end of the year. And then you, you sit the exam. And if you pass the exam, you're in. I had a month. We arrived a month before the exam. My brains trust, my teachers were not a private tutor, but my grandma, my granddad. My granddad was the enforcer with a cane. And my grandma was the energy brains drink um, um, person who got milk from a village cow, unpasteurized, freshly milked um, milk from a village cow. And the drops of nectar from the stamen of a banana tree you know, the purple flower branch, you open it up, you can squeeze the nectar out of the stamen, mix it into the unpasteurized, warm, curdled kind of milk. Mm -hmm. That was my brain food. So I spent a month doing this, like, and it's all rote learnt. Um, so first page, glug, 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 da 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 glug, 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 da 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 got in and then my dad got transferred to New Zealand. <laughs> I was the angriest four-year-old you could ever imagine. And I, I ran away from home, which was uh, going to the neighbor's house, which seemed like a long way away. But everybody knew the son of God and who was going. So I didn't, la didn't last long. A few weeks later, uh, my dad got this postcard from the company in New Zealand. You know what our postcards are like. Amazing propaganda. Um, a beautiful emerald green forest and in the middle was this golden glow where the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra was playing. <laughs> and my dad showed me this postcard and said, well, this is New Zealand. Now, why don't you want to go there? And I said, oh, okay, let's, oh, let's go there. Uh, and a few weeks later off, we went to, to Wellington 
ended up in this townhouse on the terrace. And to this point, I have never seen the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra play in the forest. <laughs> so if there's, if there's, one, there's one thing I'd like to knock off my bucket list. If any of you could make it happen for me, please. <laughs> make the symphony orchestra play in the forest for me and I will die in peace. Um, so that's, so I, I sort of tell a little bit of that story partly because I'm very, very attached and um, aware of my privilege and where I've come from. You know, we, we come from a very uh, poor uh, state and a very poor family and the wealth that I've been able to accrue and earn in my life um, is only partly because of the hard work that I've, that I've, um, that I've done. A considerable portion of that is just pure luck, uh, and I was made, and I'm made aware of that every time I go back to India, and I meet people of my age who are living on the streets near the railway stations, behind the bus stands, and the only thing that they, I did that they did not do was I was born to a different set of parents. That was my very first leg up, and from that moment on, I've benefited from that trajectory. So I've never really forgotten that. The second thing I don't forget is I come from a family of young dyers. My dad died when he was 45 and I was just after I turned 16. His mum died when she was in the late 40s. His, his dad died, it's my, one of my earliest memories, is watching him die uh, in his like, early 50s. Most people in my family die in their 50s or before. So I've only got a few years left, maybe. Um, but I'm okay with that. You know, I might live a little, little bit longer. But I'm acutely aware of the fact, despite that, that you know, story of, of young dyers, I know the impact that they've made on my life. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, intergenerational knowledge, love, wisdom, stories, insights that they've passed on. It's not stuff. It's human stories, connections, experiences, memories. And so I, what I think about is what memories am I creating for my boys? What legacy do I leave behind? What are the tools I leave behind in their minds how to navigate their lives um, as they face their challenges? And I've got a very short window, shorter than yours, where I've got the opportunity where I hold that baton. And uh, it's a very precious baton. So that's how I sort of present to most roles that I do, but in particular, this role, which is a very uniquely, uh, very unique opportunity that I've got and, uh, and, and I want to do justice to do it while I'm, while I'm in this seat. So kia ora for the wrong intro, but hopefully that does justice to, to, no. to telling my story. That's great, thank you. And I think you went different places than I thought you were gonna go, so that's awesome. <laughs> um, and it's a good reminder though, of our own legacy and, and what we're here for, right? Like sometimes you forget, so thank you for that. Really appreciate it. So maybe just tell us a little bit, not everybody will be familiar with Philanthropy New Zealand, so just the high level sort of what actually is Philanthropy New Zealand and then what are you doing um, in terms of, yeah, how are you supporting people? Sure, so Philanthropy New Zealand um, is the peak body that represents uh, grant makers and philanthropic organisations in Philanthropy in New Zealand. So we would do a variety of things from lifting the capability of the sector, educating the sector, advocating for the sector, supporting the sector. We sort of orient ourselves a little bit around building the community of philanthropy, so bringing people together, getting to know each other, supporting each other, and a little bit around expertise. So, right, you know, what are you doing? How are you doing it? How can we make it better? How can, be more, how can you be more effective in what you're doing? And then uh, sometimes we do a little bespoke piece of research and pieces of work. So, um, you know, you'll see in the next couple of weeks, we're releasing a piece of work on disaster preparedness and recovery and resilience. Really important for us. You know, the next disaster in New Zealand is, is literally, you know, hours or days or weeks away. So the more we can do in the philanthropic circle about getting ready for it um, and what we can learn from the previous um, disaster, the better. So this research is on the back of the cyclones of last year, Cyclone uh, Gabriel. So yeah, so Philanthropy New Zealand is, exists for, uh, for that purpose, if you like. And the, our mission is to celebrate and grow effective giving in Aotearoa. Yeah, that's great. So if people are interested and they want to connect in, websites are always good resource places, um, anything else that they should know, because I'll send an email out to everybody and then I'll include links so we can add any links that you want um, to include. Um, but would that be the best way to find out? Yeah, more? absolutely. I mean, we're, we're um, I mean, you hopefully get a sense. I'm, I'm pretty down to earth. So just send me an email. That's one of my, uh, Jin's here, who's the head of our um, uh, membership and, uh, and events. So you can connect with Jin. Um, but check, check the website out. It's definitely an austere looking website. We need to refurbish it, but we'll do that. Um, <laughs> 
But um, yeah, just connect with us on social media or websites and um, get in touch. And uh, you don't have to be members to uh, for you to you know benefit from um, uh, hearing from me as you are doing uh, today. Um, but we'd love for you to become a member and really get involved in what we're doing. And um, uh, it's a small team, not many of us, but we're sort of here for you. Uh, I can talk a little bit more about that later as we crack into this conversation. But you know, I think I think there's a um, uh, there's a real opportunity for Philanthropy New Zealand to to play a role in the, in the national narrative. Yeah. Well, why don't you expand on that now? Because that's that's probably of interest to people. I mean, it's yeah. it's great that you've come down here and been meeting with people. Because sometimes, you know, we're in the South Island. So there's a psychological block. I don't know if anyone else has noticed, but like. It's a bit too far, but it's not that far. No, <laughs> so, it's not that far. Yeah, do you want to tell actually, us uh, a bit more about it that? Takes, there's, that? It's a shorter flight from Wellington than going to Auckland, but you know, everyone goes over that way. Um, I've heard that often, you know, but I've, I've, I come down there often, so and I, I'm hoping to come down here more often. So please give me reasons to come down. You know, I'm, 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 it's like a like a bus in the sky now, flying for me. It's, it's I've got a pack bag already packed, ready to go. It's very easy, and I live 20 minutes away from the airport, so it's very easy to, to get down here. Look. Um, my observation, um, it may be different for, for some of you, and I imagine based on sort of the work that, uh, that you do, uh, it's different. But I came from um, technology leadership. So in my last role, I was head of digital transformation at Datacom. Uh, had 250 odd staff, um, and uh, I had to, one of the last things I did other than resign was um, making a, 120 of those staff redundant. Uh, over the space of six weeks. Uh, it is a brutal um, uh, thing to do. Uh, and you, I don't think, I, I think I'll think i ever really recover from it. Maybe I will, who knows. Um, but I didn't want, and they offered me a role somewhere else in the company, but I didn't want to be the boss that kept his job and you know let his people go. So, uh, so I left. Uh, and, but my observation of when I started this role was, and even now, the, the, the national narratives that we have in this country are incredibly negative. The cost of living is high, um, uh, the teachers are striking, the nurses are underpaid, the police are going to Australia, um, the climate change isn't being addressed, the government is pulling out and, and, and funding in spaces that uh, it has been previously participants in, at a, in an incredibly um, swift and, um, and brutal fashion. Um, there's war going on everywhere. There's conflict going on. It, it, things are broken. We can't do stuff. You know, it, it's uh, there, there's a lot of these narratives. Um, but what I observed uh, since starting in this role, partly in trying to onboard myself and get to know people in, in our membership, was uh, there's an incredible group of people doing amazing work up and down the country, meaningful work in their local areas with everyday New Zealanders, connecting with other everyday New Zealanders and bringing about amazing change. And there's a heck of a lot of agency for positive change amongst us. And it's not just sitting there, it's being utilized, it's being done. Where are those stories being told? Uh, how are we amplifying that? Because it's critical for our country's future, for my boy's future, to have that sense of hope interwoven back into a national narrative. Mm. Where do we go to for that? Uh, it, it's tough to find it. You've got to go looking for it. Mm. And so in the philanthropic sector and the impact sector and the giving sector, yeah, we better start talking about this because that's actually what we're here for, right? Mm. It's not the solving of the problem. It's the outcome that we're here for. And let's tell the stories of how we're working, why we're working, who we're working with, what's, what is working, uh, so that we give a sense of um, hope back into our citizenry. Mm. It's critically important for a few things. I lived for a few years of my life, my 20s, in Western Europe, in uh, the Netherlands, uh, Denmark, and in Norway. Uh, I lived in those countries where, and these are countries that we celebrate as being socially liberal, um, uh, progressive countries, right? But I lived through those countries when they turned and lurched towards uh, right-wing uh, fundamentalistic parties in power. They were representative democracies like us, the New Zealand First Equivalent Party, the Kingmaker Party, are right-wing parties in those countries. So who they beat down upon are immigrants. 
And I remember when I left Denmark, there was a national election going on, and I was sitting in a um, in a in an apartment room with my Danish friends, watching election ads, and I uh, watching TV, and this ad came on, and it was a Danish woman walking down the street. Blonde, blue-eyed, very stereotypical Danish woman, deliberately pushing a pram down the street, and then from off camera, from an alleyway, jumps this black man, but not even a black man, a white person with black face, <laughs> jumps out, takes the purse of the young mother, and runs away. And the Danske Folkpartei um, party candidate comes from off camera and says, "Is this what you want the future of Denmark to be? If not, vote for us." And I, I laughed. I thought, that's a great parody. That is amazing. You know, wonderful. <laughs> but th that was the ad. And then I asked my Danish friends, like, hang on. That's a joke, right? That's got to be a joke. No one, no one's going to vote for that. And two of them said, oh, we vote for them. I said, what? <laughs> but you're my friends. You can't vote for that. And they said, oh, but they're not talking like people like you, Raul. Uh, it's, it's the other people. What do you mean? Like, if I walk out there, I just look like that fella. Actually, he's, he's one of the old fellas with a black face. Um, so what do you mean? And so and I, when I came back to New Zealand, I was really thinking about these sort of things, about actually how do we create a society in New Zealand that understands and celebrates differences and diversity and utilizes that as a source of competitive advantages and strength in society rather than a source of dividing us. Mm. and tribalizing us um, and that that social cohesion is under enormous strain when the only narratives that are pre prevalent in society is negative so it's critically important that we start talking about and celebrating the good stuff that's going on mm. and so in terms of the the pnz role and our role in, in that national narrative yeah we're here to celebrate um uh, effective giving Sure, we want to grow that giving. We want to uh, make it better and more effective. And uh, absolutely, that celebration bit is critically important for our country's future. Mm, that's great. It um, resonates with me because I've felt the same. You used the word hope there, and I felt the same. Like it's so every day, it's like negative, negative newspaper-wise. So I went out to about ten charities that we've supported recently, and I said, I want to know what are some examples of good things that are happening to you. What are some bright, you know, the green shoots? And so we've compiled it now. So I'll send it to you because it's actually really mm, inspirational to see that there is good stories there. Um, the last question I've got is some people in the room are from charities and they're desperate for money. <laughs> just <laughs> let's just be honest about it. So have you got any advice for them or any thoughts like if you're in a charity, what are some of the things that they could do or yeah, any reflections oh, on that? I mean, I think um Oh, uh, what a question! Uh, look, I, I think I think I think for me, um, uh, there is a lot of empathy for that for the situation, um, uh, and I I sort of wonder um, th there are there are some tactical things that we need to do immediately, and then there's some strategic things that we need to prepare ourselves for. We can't we can't spend too long wandering, navel gazing about the strategic stuff, because there won't be many charities left over to be able to execute that strategic stuff. We need to figure out who we need to support now. And that's, there's a lot of conversations going on the philanthropy side of, of events from, uh, about what that is, who that is. Um, so know that that is happening. Talk to your existing funders and your, and your donors about what they're thinking and how, how much they know about your situation. Have an honest chat. Um, but also know that there are people like myself and others trying to activate um, the latent generosity that sits amongst society out there, amongst New Zealanders out there, um, and would love to hear some stories about where, where your local community can actually give and make a difference. People love making a difference. And so if they know that there is a need out there that they can make a difference to that resonates with them, uh, they will do so. Even in, in, even in times, difficult financial times, people look for meaning and identity and belonging in their society and, and in their locales. So give them that. Uh, it's not a, it won't necessarily fix your financial situation, um, but it's a place to start. You'll see that I'm, I'm doing a lot of those sort of interviews with the media recently, and I'm trying to uh, send that message. You'll see uh, maybe today, maybe maybe over the weekend, trade me property, 
we'll put a piece out talking about how real estate agents can be more participant in philanthropy. And one of the things I mentioned to them is, um, you know, real estate agents are selling properties in suburbs. Um, talk to the people that you're selling the property um, to or buy or um, selling the property on behalf of. What do they do on the weekends? Where do they volunteer? What do they care about? Um, maybe there's an opportunity for the, the agent themselves to donate time or effort and, and, and money to. Um, so there's little things about, uh, I think we can do tactically and don't feel too guilty about not thinking strategically. I think the next few months is going to be really, really important. One last thing on that. Um, you'll see that there's a lot of conversation taking place about intergenerational wealth transfer. Uh, the way I see intergenerational wealth transfer is, maybe it's a very, very Asian way of thinking about it, which is it's more than just about the money. Yeah, there's money, but it's about the networks, the know-how, the wisdom, uh, the who you know, uh, but also your hopes and dreams for the future. The, the ripple you wish to make beyond your time here, um, while you're still here the giving while living as well. And it's a wonderful opportunity, for, I think, for charities and for philanthropic organizations to start talking to people about the immense work and, and, and effort they've made in creating this wonderful country called Aotearoa that we've been privileged to, to live in. How do they wish to fortify its future by identifying the current needs and the needs beyond here? Uh, let's start having that conversation. It's not just about the money. It's about participating in the country's future and contrib contributing towards that and embracing them as contributors towards that intergenerationally. Uh, and the, the last bit about intergener intergenerational wealth is it's not just about the oldies. <laughs> it's about those who are young. It's their future. How are you including them in their story and the inter intergenerational story? Their, the, their ratio of labour to money that they're giving out when they're younger might be different. But as they get more and more uh, uh, older, the means to give is, is more than that they had before. But how are you building that into their psyche, the behavior um, of what it means to be a New Zealander, what it means to participate in your community, what it means to build social cohesion to the labor that you give, the volunteer hours that you give, the money that you give. So start building the networks um, as charities with people, but not just the people that you're helping, but the people that are participants in your community in your suburbs your neighbours, your sports clubs, your arts clubs, etc. Great. Thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing with us all. I think it's good. Sometimes organisations can feel impersonal, honestly. So it's good that we can meet somebody from Philanthropy New Zealand. And now there's a connection point that each of you share a brief moment in time, we were together having lunch together. So thank you for coming. Um, so these lunches um, happen usually once a month, sometimes every two months, depends on what's happening in the world. Um, but if you'd like to find out more, I do have this impact email list that goes out to about 950 people. And that's how I generally tell people there's another lunch coming. And then I use LinkedIn quite a lot, so I'll post about it. So if you want to be on that list, just hit reply when I send the follow up and then I can add you to the list. Um, the other thing is just, uh, I probably always forget to do this because not I haven't met all of you yet, but I work as a lawyer. So just to be clear about that, I do the podcasting and the books and things, but my actual job is as a lawyer. I'm a partner at Perryfield Lawyers. We have about 80 people. We do property disputes, corporate commercial, and, but we have a unique focus on impact-driven organizations. And my aim is to be the go-to lawyer for every charity in New Zealand. So why not have a dream, right? And I think it's achievable because we've got an amazing group. Um, Anne-Marie is here and she's one of the team members who helps. Um, so just to lay it out there, you will know people and I know that you'll know other charities that need help and support. So please send them our way. We're really here, we wanna support and help them. Um, so I'm gonna post something on LinkedIn, probably a video of us talking and I'll try to tag some of you in you're welcome to like it or share it or comment, and then other people can know and, and benefit from what we heard today. Um, that's kind of how social media works. <laughs> so um, if you're willing to do that, that would be great. And if we're not connected, I'm happy to connect with any of you on LinkedIn. So um, really great to have so many of you come today, and I hope you have a good rest of your days and wonderful weekends. And let's now um, move around and just meet as many people as you can, a little bit of speed dating. Um, and it's great to, you're going to be here for a little bit and 
can say hi to people. But thanks, everybody, for coming along today.